thousands of luminous spheres. Suzanne Paul. Hello, I'm Rhys Darby. I know what you're thinking. Look at the sky, he's made it. But to get involved in television these days, you have to pass a series of humiliating tests. I only got to host this job after winning season four of Presenter Idol. Mmm, good times. At number 63, it's New Zealand Idol. It all began back in 1999 when the show Pop Stars was created. It was a reality TV phenomenon and made stars of true bliss. Obviously, we were the first and we feel like the pioneers, but the truth of the matter is the rest of the world thinks that it started in Australia, so we got used to the fact that nobody was ever going to kind of go, it was started in New Zealand with those five girls. The show Pop Stars was made in over 30 countries. In its footsteps followed the UK program Pop Idol, which became American Idol and coughed up Kelly Clarkson. The concept then paddled into New Zealand waters in 2004. It's the auditions that draw you into the show. Oh, I forgot it. Uh, I like watching the first few episodes where everybody's a bit, a bit shit. They're the fun episodes, you know, where they're, they're, it's just that's the best part of the whole show. To watch someone who's extremely untalented really give it their all is extremely. First. Paul Ellis was one of the judges. This is pretty damn pitiful. It was bloody hard to sit there and see a bunch of very average kids trying to impress. But after the talentless have been axed, you're left with some seriously good singers. In the first series, it came down to Ben Lummis and Michael Murphy. And the winner is Ben. I loved it. I kind of felt like uh, I was born, born to do that. I don't know where this is going. His first song, They Can't Take That Away, went to number one for seven weeks and sold 60,000 copies. New Zealand Idol was working for Lummis. It's raised my profile. Everybody knows who I am, and as you know, most people do anyway. The first uh, winner, Ben Lummis and the runner-up, Michael Murphy, they were true pop idols in this country. You know, they were adored by teenage girls. But the next two winners weren't so fortunate. Rosita Vai now sings in a backing band, and Matthew Sornoa hasn't been heard from musically since he moved to Australia. New Zealand Idol hasn't been on our screens for three years now, but don't count it out yet. It is one of the most successful formats in the last 10 years in TV. OK, look at this page. Did you see all the Zs? Your eye just goes straight to it. Is it New Zealand? And you get a little New Zealand reading orgasm. I've always been drawn to Zs on a page, and I don't know whether that's part of being New Zealander or, you know, whether Zambians and Zimbabweans have the same sort of skill. When the book is talking about New Zealand, we feel so content. But when it happens in Hollywood, Christ, it's exciting! They say something bad about New Zealand, it's like, OK, that's cool, but they say something good about New Zealand, it's like, yeah, I'm a Kiwi. There's only about four and a half million of us. It's cool. Yeah, we made it big time. We're in Hollywood, people. Oh, you just swell with pride, don't you? I mean, uh, I saw an episode of Scrubs recently and they did something about New Zealand. You'll feel good, trust me. Trust you, you don't even know where New Zealand is. You can dance your way there from old Zealand. You an idiot. We don't care how bad the movie is. No. If they mention New Zealand, it's our favourite movie. The next flight out of here goes non-stop to Auckland, New Zealand. I was on my way back in New Zealand. He told me that he was being transferred to New Zealand. Please, Mum, is this New Zealand? New Zealand. Now, where am I going to go, man? Cliffs on both sides. I'm not going to paddle in New Zealand. Sheila enjoys horse riding and comes from New Zealand. Well, some buddies and I went hang gliding off these cliffs in New Zealand. New Zealand's gift to Rosner Heim. Ship out to New Zealand. When are you going back to New Zealand? And now we're world famous all over the world. It's kind of like um, become less rare or something, like New Zealand's had a much more of a PR yeah. campaign of itself. Working, but you work we could fight off the recession by charging people $10 if they use our country's name. Perfect strangers, your bill? We're not going to New York, we're going to New Zealand. <laughs> New York, New Zealand, it could happen to anybody. You're going to New Zealand? 
the sheep capital of the world? That'll be $30, thanks, Balky. How lucky can you get? Well, it wasn't until the 1970s that New Zealand got the international fast food franchises. That's alliteration for you. McDonald's, KFC, Pizza Hut. But we had our own idea for fast food. Pam Corkery's Creamy Pavs, the Hurry Up Hungy. Probably, probably haven't heard of that one. The winning idea, though, pies. Kentucky Fried Chicken was the first greasy invader, settling down in 1971. Pizza Hut and McDonald's soon after. In 1977 came Georgie Pie, a New Zealand original. I remember when it opened, it was so exciting. We went out and we joined the queues. We used to go there every, every Friday and Saturday night at the drags, you know, in between running from the police and have a nice mince and cheese pie and a coat. They were only a dollar or something as well. I didn't really run from the police. Oh, I don't think any night out on the town was complete without going to Georgie Pie and burning, you know, burning the roof of your mouth. The tradition of the Kiwi Pie should never be underestimated. It was looking promising, but then in 1998, the doors closed permanently and there was a pie-shaped hole in everyone's heart. The day that they showed Georgie Pie was, was a suckful day. Oh, man, bring it back, Georgie Pie. Bring it back. Georgie Pie. Why the hell did Georgie Pie ever go away? Why did it leave us? I cried when, when, when it went, and then I cried when I found out that uh, McDonald's shut it down. So McDonald's, you yeah. know? That's not true, Mr Farnay. Georgie Pie was going broke and put themselves on the market. I don't quite understand how it went out of business in New Zealand since, you know, you're selling pies to Kiwis, you know? It's not like you're selling books or anything. I think the dollar menus killed Georgie Pie. It was such a good idea that they undercut themselves to the point where they probably had to stop short of putting dog meat into the pies to make any money out of it. McDonald's bought most of their buildings and as part of the deal also got the rights to Georgie Pie. If you want to bring it back then you have to buy it from McDonald's. Not that two students in Christchurch did. In 2008 they opened a Georgie Pie for the day and sold their 500 pies in 45 minutes with queues down the street. I don't think Georgie Pie likes Sir Edmund Hillary belongs to an era that sadly is fading and, and, and won't be back. Oh, but it might be back. McDonald's are thinking about making the pies available in them at cafes. You might return once more to mince and pastry paradise. Before TV came along in 1962, kids were little angels, probably. But afterwards, all they'd do is watch telly. Luckily, our icon of after-school programs was such a lovely man. By the time I finish with you, mate, not even the Smurfs will recognise you. Uh, after school was a programme for children coming home after school. <laughs> Ollie Olsen was studying to become an Anglican minister when he realised he could reach a bigger audience on TV and be a better role model than Stu from Nice One. Oh, sir, 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 I don't think that's fair, sir. Give me such a low mark of 0%. I don't think it's fair either, but that's the lowest mark I could give. Parents hated it. Nice bad role model. We weren't a positive role model, so when Ollie Olsen came along, Ollie filled that, uh, that role. He had a couple of famous trademarks. The first was his guitar. It was there right from the beginning. The, um, and I guess what exploded that was Fang Face, uh, this, the song about a werewolf who, who does good. And you always had those little jingles, you know, before uh, the old TV shows, and I'll never forget that one, you know, he's a crime fighting werewolf, he's Fang Face, oh, 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 oh. You know, His second trademark can be repeated by a generation of kids. It came about when he visited a school for the deaf. And I thought, why don't I do a signature? So I did the keep cool till after school signature. Ollie Olsen was a legend. He had that keep cool to after school kind of sign language thing going on. The population sort of reacted to that in a way that we never even knew would happen. I always did keep cool to after school when he said it, you know, it made me, it did carry me through. In fact, it carries me through my adult life as well. Just keep cool to after school. Practically every time somebody recognises who I am, you know, say, hey, what's that thing again, man? Yeah. So you do it and you do the keep cool till after school. <laughs> but the longest running kids show is What Now, which started in 1981 and is still going strong. Here she is, our feminine fitness freak, delicious Diane. And this was for kids? Spot On was another classic kid show which spawned a megastar. 
Phil Keegan has gone on to host The Amazing Race, but even he can't compete with the man that created this pop culture phenomenon. Keep cool till after school. Mmm, I know some sign language as well. I learned some in the army. Hey, you guys, there's someone behind the tree. Quick, shoot him. Oh, no, it's one of our guys. Stop it. Watch out for the booby trap. Let's go. Woo! Coming up, three babies in sacks. It can only be a punchline to a joke or Anguettes is about. And New Zealand internet stars. Which one is the biggest? Tomorrow, 8.30 on C4. You know what? I've had enough. They have it so easy in this world. Never having to work, always centre of attention. They really like boobs. Of course, I'm talking about meteorologists and babies. Mainly babies, actually. Anne Giddies, the photographer, she had enough of slack babies. She found a way to put them to work. New Zealand's Anne Geddes is a giant in the world of photography. Normal sized everywhere else. She saw 25 million pictures of babies in calendars, books and pot plants. When I first started, a lot of photographers used to say to me, well, you know, of course I used to do babies when I was starting out. You know, it was kind of like, that's something that you do until you start photographing something important. I think Anne Geddes was uh, the f one of the first examples that we had in this country of having a good and simple idea and that it would work overseas. Because I think when she just sold her calendars here, people were like, oh, look, there's a baby with a giant pumpkin. But when she started selling them to Americans, uh, people who watch Oprah, then suddenly it wasn't so crazy. But some people do have problems with her work. Babies creep me out in general, but babies sitting inside pumpkins had nightmares for years. I think you can actually see um, the look of humiliation in the photos of the babies. I'd hate to be an Anne Geddes baby. In 2004, Anne Geddes worked with Celine Dion and babies, of course. The Miracle album, a music and photo mixture, notched up sales of two and a half million copies. And at least one person would volunteer their baby for a Geddes shoot. Yeah, I mean, probably, probably would actually, i be honest. I mean, it would be kind of a status thing if you have that hanging on your wall. I'd probably put my child through that just so, oh yeah, Anne Giddies did that for me. She's a close family friend. We hold her in the Bahamas together. Since Māori TV began in 2004, it's chiselled a moko onto the face of popular culture. Well, I think we just make TV different. You know, we do it in a different way. I couldn't believe that, that no one had thought about doing Anzac Day as a national broadcast. And people like it. Most of their local shows have a strong Māori perspective. DIY Marae, Boil Up, a cooking show, and even the advice show, Ask Your Aunties. No, I love them all, I love Kai Time. Our humour's coming across in some of the programmes. Uh, I just like some of the documentaries that they're doing as well. I try and catch code. I, um, that's a really good sports show. I used to like that karaoke program they had. That was hilarious. The Māori karaoke, that is awesome. Check it out. But it became a, a little bit of a cult hit. Fano, fano, ko wai rā te toki, hau mie huie, bai tie. Māori TV was once a controversial idea, but now people can see the value of it, and it looks like it's here to stay. I think what Māori television has done by getting into so many homes is it's made it cool. It's cool to be brown, it's cool to be Pacific, it's cool to be Māori. New Zealand is a huge success on the World Wide Web. And like a Russian doll, we've enclosed a countdown within a countdown of New Zealand-related interweb success. At number five, amateur jailbait Shake to Savage's mega-hit swing. Two million views. To see people posting up their own little dance routines to swing was just a, you know, I just thought it was a good laugh and overnight just turned into a storm. At four, an animation made by Australians taking the piss out of the New Zealand accent. Oh, no! Four million views. What are you doing, Boo? Dude, I'm beached ears. Number three, an animation made by an American that has our native flightless bird in flight. At least briefly, 21 million views. At number two is New Zealander Jessica Rose, who played the role of Lonely Girl 15. 25 million people followed the real-life daily saga of a teenage girl. And when it turned out to be a hoax, ooh, angry. It wasn't like we were trying to, you know, be like, ooh, let's go out and deceive all these people and hurt their feelings or anything. It was, it was always a story. 
The surprising number one is a Korean student who is studying in Auckland. This clip of him playing guitar has been seen a confusing 57 million times. Who is watching that? Anyway, well done, Fun2. You're number one. I never imagined that I, I could be uh, some kind of stars or a famous, famous, famous person. An anal on my table. That's disgusting. The bone people has made it into popular culture. Here it is an outrageous fortune. But if I wanted to, I could change the title to the boner people on account of the three-way near the end. So, um, so I guess it's not that closely based on the books, eh? <laughs> I mean, it's the most famous New Zealand book of all time. And the reason it's famous is that in 1985 it won the Booker Prize, the only New Zealand book to win the Distinguished Award. This is the sort of thing that goes way beyond just the, the reading and writing community of a country. It was, it was, you know, pat on the back time for all of us, really. If you win them, uh, you sort of increase your sales tenfold, you know, the very next day. But a lot of people have trouble reading the actual book. I read it many years ago, and like, I think like everyone else, I struggled through the first 150 pages. But once I got into it, I really enjoyed it. This was a book that um, divided readers. Um, you know, you either loved it or you hated it. And I went to the library and I got it, and I read some, and then I went, I don't think I need to be reading Kerry Holmes' The Bone People, and I returned it to the library. But it is an extraordinary book, you know. Um, it's a kind of a monument, however, it doesn't really stand as a book which still requires any actual reading of it. You should just be aware of it and admire it. The Bone People has sold over a million copies worldwide. Hume's book is a story of abuse, violence, love, death and family. She went inside her own being and dredged um, appalling and, and difficult things out. It's a kind of a traumatic book, actually. Carrie Hume has followed up with short stories, but her worldwide fan base is waiting on a second novel. Sometimes you're just not ready to write that particular story. You need either uh, more, more um, pleasure or more experience of grief or whatever. So, um, slow writer. Sorry, that's the fact of my life. Now, Kerry Hume is not fond of talking publicly. There's a sign outside her house that says, Kerry Hume is not fond of talking publicly. Please use the private entrance. Kerry Hume, known for her asexuality and B, her writing. After the break, the beehive. Is it a magnificent monolith or a blight upon the capital cityscape? Let's get out of here. So we turn into cartoons. Hey! Now, the French have always been into weird, odd buildings. They built the Eiffel Tower, that glass pyramid in front of the Louvre. There's that croissant-shaped boat that you can sail in and eat. But in 1981, we got our own weird building. Our Parliament building in Wellington is meant to look like this. But instead it looks like this. During World War I, they ran out of bricks to finish it. We could have had a really cool Parliament if, if they'd continued to build it to the original scale and, and done the other half, but I like the Kiwi way of, nah, get stuffed. In the 60s, they decided they'd do something about the unfinished building. Finish it off or maybe do something different. Basil Spencer, visiting top English architect, had an idea and a tongue like varnished gold. He said that this building would be a hub, that it would be a hub for government, that it would be a hub for Wellington. He said it would be a hub for New Zealand. He said it was going to be a dynamo that worked. It was a building where everyone worked together like bees in a hive. The politicians had never heard anyone speak like this. They were thoroughly charmed and they were won over. Basil Spence also came up with the name. He said it was a hornet's nest, and the solution he proposed when he popped out with it, he, he declared, was a beehive. The beehive was finished in 1981. There wasn't else much going for Wellington back then, do you know what I mean? Like, we only had the beehive, <laughs> so everyone made a big deal out of it. Um, you know, it was an interesting building. It's not particularly gorgeous, but it's a point of interest. In the 90s, they were going to move the beehive and finish the original parliament building, but it was too expensive and it would have meant reprinting the $20 note. I guess that's the end of the story. We're left with the beehive staying put. The building is visited by tens of thousands of people every year. Uh, it's on our television news every night. It's on our $20 note. It's on postage stamps. The promise of, that Basil Spence gave that it was going to be a symbol for government, a symbol for Wellington, a symbol for the nation really has come to pass. God bless you, Beehive. God bless. 
Lighter Natural Glow blends in perfectly with all skin colours. But I do use the Natural Glow. I've become quite addicted to it, actually. It's quite good. It's great for, you know, when you get the suntan mark because you're wearing the wrong top. When Suzanne Paul arrived from England, she got burnt to a crisp. There was no combined makeup and sunscreen product, so she tried to invent one. I had some real disasters because they would give me a sample and I would dust it on and go out and I'd be all orange and sparkly and then I went out all glittery and then I went out and a friend said to me, there's something wrong with your face, you look like a red Indian. And it was just so, it, yes, there was a lot of uh, um, trial and error and then I got it right in the end because it's the thousands of luminous spheres, you see, that make all the difference. If you're using the original loose powder natural glow, contributing to natural glow success was the infomercial. Actually made up. After I'd filmed that advert, I said never again. I'm never doing that ever again. That's the most awful experience. And everybody said it was the worst advert they'd ever seen in their lives. But we couldn't afford to film a new one, so it went on TV, and for some reason it was a hit. Yes, she was annoying, but so is Michael Hill. And look how successful he is. You know, I mean, part of it, part of the marketing of it is to be repetitive and annoying isn't it? That's how your message gets across. And one other thing helped. A single phrase. Because natural glow is actually made up of thousands of luminous spheres. Even men know it. Men say to me, oh, thousands of luminous spheres. And of course, the other one they all shout at me is, but wait, there's more. And there is more. Next came the Suzanne clip. I look at it now and think, why did anybody buy that? But actually, it was twenty nine ninety five, and and people loved it. She was at the top of her game and could do no wrong. Even her song "Blue Monkey" made it to number seventeen on the charts. I just don't want to be a, a, an old lady and get to be eighty and think, I always wish I'd launched a record and a music video. If I think about doing it, I just do it. No, but maybe she shouldn't have done this. Sort of a um, Kappa Hacker meets Las Vegas cabaret. The cabaret restaurant made her bankrupt, but appearing on Dancing with the Stars saved her life. It felt like my whole world was falling apart. To be able to go out and dance every day for six to eight hours, you couldn't think about anything else, couldn't think about being bankrupt. My head was just filled every day with dancing, and it was just a great escape from reality for me. Suzanne and <laughs> And to win it was just, yes, even better. And now she's back with Natural Glow again. And being a natural entrepreneur, the ideas keep coming. How somebody in the clothes industry did not pick up on that there are no clothes in New Zealand for short women. What's that all about? Suzanne Paul Petit, available now. Now, one of my favourite moments in New Zealand comedy is when, after years of performing on stage, the boys from the Naked Samoans returned home and broke into TV stations and forced them to play their little cartoon. It worked out fine. That's it! Stuff yeah. off! I don't have to listen to you! It's part of my culture! Christ, you're annoying! That's it! Jesus! Fantastic to see that we've got our own sort of version of Simpsons. I love Brotan, and I think uh, every kid in New Zealand loves Brotan, especially if you're Polynesian. Brotan is, uh, is big in the poly, poly world. Brotan began with the Naked Samoans, a stage act that featured all of the future voices of Brotan. We were really drunk after one of our Naked Samoan shows and Oscar came up and said, oh, this lady wants to make an animated series. And we were drinking and we went and said, do you want to do it? And we went, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. I think animation was the only way that the Nakeds could have worked on TV, really, because our life stuff was quite chaotic. The show is not for the easily offended and even sometimes not for the hard to offend. Yeah, you just show people your tongue when you like them like this. And, and your bum when you hate them like this. Hmm? That's bloody Maoris. How do I respond to people saying Bro Town's racist? I just say, oh, you must be dumb. Or you don't watch the show. Because I think it's brilliant. <laughs> uh, would they? <laughs> I think a lot of us can relate to, to, to the kind of humour that's on there. I'm going to the pub. I may be sometime. Every character in there is like someone that grew up down my street. Even royalty's into it, or at least in it. Stay in mind if I hear Prince Charles. No, not at all. They met Prince Charles backstage at a play. We had the mic standing by, and we went, "Hey, can you just say this for our cartoon?" And he went. Oh, I don't think so. But thankfully, Helen Clark, the then Prime Minister, was there and she vouched for us. The Prime Minister, Scribe, Chris Other stars that have lent their voices? 
Rove, but that's John Campbell, Kesha Castle Hughes, Cliff Curtis, on. Neil and Tim Finn, oh, and Flight of the Concords. Our manager thought it would be a great idea to form a super group. Idiot. And do a kind of Flight of the Finn Brothers thing and make millions. You're so 70s. You guys must be your wife 70. Shut up. Shut up. The Brotown team was also involved in the hit movie Sione's Wedding. I know. It's the same idiots, except different different costumes. Which could be the beginning of a new industry, Hollywood. After the screening of this, all the people are going to run out and just root Polynesians, you know, because they want to be brown and pale like Hollywood, and they will all want my Hollywood. I'm Valer, but you can call me later. Pew, pew. Margaret Mahi is mad. So the tasteful little skull with the rose in its teeth. But also New Zealand's most loved children's author. Her stories have been read by every kid for the last 30 years. They're brilliant. They're absolutely they're mad, ridiculous, funny and brilliant. I did actually read some of her books at school. She was huge at school. She was so prevalent that my friend's younger brother, when he went to primary school, he thought that all stories just had the sort of phrase by Margaret Mayhew straight after the title. So when he used to write stories and hand them in in class, you know, it was The Pirates by Margaret Mayhew by Hayden Drake. Hello. Margaret Mahi is prolific. Even she doesn't know how many stories she's written. When I became a full-time writer, I sort of swore that I'd take any, on any work that was moderately compatible with self-respect. That meant not only writing children's books, but writing articles and writing for television. Her biggest TV show was Madigan's Quest, an epic post-apocalyptic story about a travelling circus. Someone at the, the BBC, kids, loved Margaret Mahi absolutely loved Margaret Mahi. So out came Madigan's Quest. It grew into probably one of the most expensive pieces of TV ever shot in this country. Her best known story was also her first, A Lion in the Meadow. It's funny as hell, it's really dramatic. It's just perfect. The story was published in the school journal, which was in every classroom in the country, and featured work by Janet Frame, Colin McCann and James K Baxter. I think I always think of the school journal as being one of New Zealand's leading literary magazines, but of course it's hidden <laughs> because it's in schools. Every classroom had a little long uh, rectangular box full of school journal number one, two, three, four, five, six, twenty million. Yeah, every second story was by Margaret Mayhe. By Margaret Mayhe. Well, my favourite poem in the school journal was James K. Baxter's Fireman. Clang, 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 says the red fire bell. There's a big fire blazing at the Grand Hotel. Hey! Put it out! Hey! Put it out! That's extra bit there on the end there with the putting it out. Woo! It's out! Good one! Up next, the police help the youth of New Zealand get their first pash. And beautiful people doing aerobics, it can only mean one thing. It's Miss Universe in the 80s. Now this link is actually one of my favourites. I think the gag really worked well here. I remember at the time when I did it, everyone just you could just see their faces like there was a lot of open mouths like, oh wow, how can you know how can something be that funny? Yeah. Who liked disco? <laughs> Who would have thought, you know, because it actually in fact it's, it's a very serious sort of thing, the blue light and what they do for the kids here, and we kind of we kind of discussed that too afterwards. Yeah. It was a strange concept. Police run dance parties. The Aussies came up with it and we thought it was a good idea. So in 1983, we mixed cops, kids and shy dancing to positive effect. There is a noticeable drop in the level of vandalism. It also helps to a degree to control would-be uh, glue sniffers. Blue light discos, the meaning of life when you're at high school. It's breaking down the barriers between police, the community and especially the kids. With teenagers being the self-conscious little monkeys they are, it can be hard to get the disco raging. It always just turned out with, you know, the girls on one half of the room and the boys on the other half of the room, uh, not talking to each other, not looking at each other at all. Usually at the start is when the police officers make, um, embarrass themselves and dance and try and get the kids up dancing. Our favourite is YMCA because it just gets everyone up there dancing. The Macarena was good for a little while. Um, that gets everyone up and dancing and um, yeah, ABBA's one of my favourites and we do a like a basic 
line dance type dance so everyone can join in. I was crowned with my step to the side dancing queen of the disco. It may have been because my babysitter was the judge but then the king of the disco was my cousin. So it's a little bit disappointing. We didn't have school dances so this was basically our only chance because I went to an all girls Catholic school to have interaction with boys and <laughs> um, I remember I met my first boyfriend at a blue light rage. School's so it's just boring and rubbish and all you want to do is hang out with your mates and then that night comes where you can wear mufti all night and you know and like stand in the corner and not dance because it's way not cool to do that um blue light discos were became as important as georgie pie <laughs> seriously it was so awesome it's still going 54 branches and 200,000 kids attending each year and while they now call them dance parties and not discos, only one thing has really changed since it began. Oh, the music's definitely changed. I don't recognise some of the stuff now. So they always put on YMCA or, like I say, a bit of ABBA for me. There have been a million family entertainment shows and most have forgotten the minute they're over, but not Top Town. Here's the way he team back in full flight. I remember from Top Town, Stubbies, Bad Hair, Bad Moustaches and Mark Leishman. Well, game one is called Totem Walk. Uh, Chief Kibasabi Ferguson, he big problems with this game, how it work. I guess it harks back to those things that we all think that summers were hotter, that ice creams were sweet or something, you know. Um, and Top Town is just one of those things that brings back a fond memory. Television New Zealand presents the 1986 LNP Top Town Final. On a Friday night, we'd have the big parade. And this was a, a real hometown parade where all the, the competitors would be on the back of trucks or in vintage cars or convertibles or something like this. And we'd just do a run up the street and uh, and us as the presenters would be standing there with a big bag of, you know, minties and be throwing sweets out trying to avoid having kids running under the cars and things like that. And then on the Saturday, um, they, they, they'd turn up for the show and you'd get five or 10,000 people to come along just to watch. The games were mainly slippery water-soaked hijinks that created some risque moments. You'd have the inappropriate slippery pole where you have Nairi the netballer just trying to balance on like this with the, with the pillows flying at her and flower bombs and all sorts of stuff over the round power pole. And then, you know, in would slide Gary the fireman, zzzz, bump, right in behind. <laughs> inappropriately in behind her and then boof, the other fireman behind Gary and then... <laughs> Top Town returned in 2009. I think the time was right, you know, to bring it back. I think, um, I think New Zealanders could do with a bit of uniting in that respect, could do a bit, of, a, bit of, a bit of town pride, you know. But while the new one was locked in Christchurch, the old one travelled round the country. The good thing about it, I think, was that it got... Uh, TV out into the regions, into small town New Zealand, and they just love it. You know, sometimes things that are really big eventually sort of taper off and then just disappear altogether. Like the Charleston dance craze of the 20s, or having a car horn that sounds like the General Lee. Oh, come on, give it a rest, mate. Or beauty pageants. Oh, I'd like to point out that I still do the Charleston, by the way. Although badly. Hello, I'm a third year business management student studying accounting and Japanese. I'm also planning my own exhibition of surrealist paintings. In 1983, all of New Zealand was pretty much like Christchurch is today. So when the Miss Universe New Zealand finals were on, of course everyone tuned in. Hi, I enjoy exactly what I'm doing now, exercising, as I attend a gym regularly and I belong to a modern dance group. Miss Universe New Zealand 1983 is... Miranda! Whoa! How does it feel to be Miss Universe New Zealand 1983? Wonderful. <laughs> Lorraine went to the Miss Universe final in the USA, but she had stiff competition from Miss Venezuela. We all, as a family, used to watch it and then we'd have dibs on who we thought would be sort of one, two, three. You know, we'd go for the whole trifecta thing and we never, ever picked it, you know, because it was always Miss Venezuela. My memories of watching Miss Universe and their many happy memories is always, you know, uh, Miss Venezuela. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't Miss Venezuela. The first runner-up is Miss USA. Miss New Zealand is Miss Universe. When Miss New Zealand won it, it was like, 
Wow, we didn't see that coming. But it's our country, our represent, our choice. And I think I might have had a little tiny cry. And um, and then I remember my mum, when they put the crown on her, she mum went, oh, she has got big ears. It's one of those things, particularly back in that, that era, where New Zealand being on a world stage in anything was a big deal. Um, representing my country, well, it was easy because it's such a beautiful country and everybody over in the United States, as soon as they sort of read New Zealand, they said, oh, that's a beautiful country, I want to go there. She did speak with a really terrible New Zealand accent as well, which made you less proud. You just wanted to go, no, shh, Lorraine, shh, shh, don't say anything, shh. Just be pretty, just be pretty. She was so pretty that Topaki band Economic Wizards wrote this song for her. I almost went my trail when you showed them Kiwi girls with a grouses. She became part of our own version of Posh and Bex when she married all black superstar Murray Maxted in 1986. between New Zealand and Australia began over a fast-running horse. The legendary gelding Farlap was born in Timaru, yet the Aussies claimed he was one of theirs. We have two versions ready to go. If he wins, Australian Wonder Horse beats the world. And if he loses, New Zealand horse fails in Mexico. Anyway, they've continued to try and claim our stuff like the Pavlova, Crowded House, and they're still doing it today with buildings evermore. But there is one New Zealander that some argue we should let Australia keep. You can have him, Australia. Honestly, have Russell Crowe. Take him, take him all. You can have him, you can put him in Sydney, and you can make sure that you keep him there forever. The case for Russell Crowe being Australian. Bad behaviour, arrested for throwing a phone, some scuffles and a punch-up. Also, like Australians, he's quite an ego. He allegedly yells, go, Russ, go, during the sex. But the case for Russell Crowe being a New Zealander is that he's a great actor. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Three Oscar nominations and a win for Gladiator prove that. I love Russell Crowe. He gets a bad rap, but I love him because he makes acting seem tough. No matter how much of a dick I think that guy is, I think he's, whenever he's in a movie, he's a really engaging and really convincing actor. Russell Crowe was born in New Zealand and left for Oz when he was four, returned at 14 and left again at 21. He has a New Zealand passport and an Australian passport. We should claim him. Another Oscar for the National Mental Piece. Of course, the shoe fits on the other side of the coin. I've got a list here of people we claim as our own. Australian actor Keisha Castle Hughes, Australian director Roger Donaldson, South African rugby player Andrew Mertens, and Canadian actor Anna Paquin. So, a bit upsetting there. Let's have a break. Next, gloss spills champagne, BMW juice, and yuppie blood all over the floor. She may not be beautiful, but uh, how do they put it? All cats are grey in the dark. Also, Prince Charles stares at big-bottomed Kiwi lasses and his little Willie stands up. Skins, next on C4. Now, the 80s. It had its own special vibe going on, really, didn't it? The acid wash jeans, jazzercise, Rubik's Cube, bopping. Oh, and everyone was rich. I was at school. On the way home, I'd stop by the stockbrokers to collect the cash I'd made that day. Then I'd go to the dairy, buy it. Then I'd get home, my home, which I owned. And then I'd, I'd eat money for, for dinner. A, a lot of that's not true. But there was this legendary TV series that satirised the 80s while we were still living in it. We were showing on screen what was actually happening in real life. And 80s real life was all partying, making money, twirling and shaking your money maker. You know, I reckon Jean-Paul Gaultier's gone off. That woman looks like a yak. That's what I thought. It was so glamorous and it had all these flash houses and flash cars and everyone was getting it on with each other. But it also had, which I love, these really strong female characters with massive shoulder pads who would stop at nothing. It was just, it was high drama. Thank you. But no, that's the one that Bianca Jagger oh, got. God forbid that Paris fashion should pander to a Nicaraguan and they're barely out of the jungle. And cancel my talkback show, will you? Perhaps it was just that whole 80s glamour over the topness of it that we kind of went, hey, yeah, we're citizens of the world. We can be 
gorgeous and glamorous and have amazing lives too. <laughs> Many people outside Auckland thought it was almost a documentary of the kind of callous, shallow nature of Aucklanders. Alistair, I want that job. I want, I want. I, I thought all the women on it were hot. I just remember watching it religiously just to look at the woman on it. So there was like, you know, there's older blonde ones and younger brunettes, and I was just fascinated by the whole lot. The show ran for three years and launched a thousand careers. In this scene alone, there's the late Kevin Smith, Lisa Chappell, who went on to star in McLeod's Daughters, Craig Parker, Danielle Cormack, and Push Push's Mikey Havoc. Yeah, what magazine's that? Where? And Gloss, well, like the 80s, it had to end. Magda! The best movies are always based on books. Catwoman, Saw 5, and Whale Rider which is based on Witi Ihimaida's novel, Whale Rider. I'm really proud of Whale Rider because it, it has shown that a story that comes from a very, very small village on the East Coast does have the power to transcend its location, to transcend its race and to transcend its nationality. Witsi Ihemaida had already flirted with popular culture when he became the first published Māori author of short stories. Ponamu Ponamu was released in 72 and was quickly added to school reading lists. Inadvertently, he became the champion for Māori authors because all our books that we used to use were by nameless, no-name no European people. I grew up reading his work as many other New Zealand you know, young people begin reading with his books in school. Um, and I just think he's, he's an amazing writer. He's not afraid to, to speak his mind. His first novel, Tangi, was also the first Māori novel to be published. And again, it was all about everyday life in New Zealand. It was great reading things about us and, um, and them being held in that regard. Essentially, though, he's just a great storyteller. <laughs> if you don't write about life in New Zealand, then nobody will know about it. And if you don't write about Māori life, then all of those, uh, those descendants of mine who are living in those, in those worlds won't know what we were like at the end of this millennium. Now, I've been asked to share a personal story about when the royal family visited New Zealand. I don't have one, so hit it! Clang, clang, clang went the red fire bell. There's a big fire blazing at the Grand Hotel. Hey! And this next story is about the royal family visiting. When Prince Charles recently visited, the crowd went mild. But it wasn't always this way. The Duke of Edinburgh was our first royal visitor in 1869. The 300 people that lived here thronged to see him. Since then, the Queen or some distant relation has crashed on our country's couch more than a hundred times. The 1953 visit was the first time a reigning monarch visited us. Where I'm from in Hawke's Bay, the Queen actually drove through the neighbourhood and all the houses that are on that path from Napier to Hastings, the houses are all macked out since 1953 or whatever it was. The royals are shown the best of New Zealand. Here, the Duke has shown a tunnel or something. In 1981, the Queen faced a brass medley, Ugh. and Prince Charles was shown this. <laughs> the most famous visit was when Charles came with his lovely wife, Princess Diana, in 1983. Little Prince William took his first steps here, but times were changing. In 1986, the Queen was egged, which made headlines here and around the world. Nearly half the country wants to become independent of the royal family nowadays. I think there'll always be you know, respect for you know, the royal family when they come here, and there will be a degree of ceremony. But in terms of thousands of people lining the streets because that's what you did, no, we've seen the end of that. Except if Prince Harry visited, he'd pull a crowd. OK, folks, well, see you later. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have said folks. What am I... <laughs> Warner Brothers? Um, folks, it's kind of a... What do you say? Peep, OK, peep, OK. Fans, are they fans? Who's watching this? Just anyone, really. OK, every... OK, New Zealand, New Zealand. OK, New Zealand. What if you sell us overseas? OK, world. Just, ah, uh, let's be honest. OK, Auckland, isn't it, really? Next time, Fred Dagg, short shorts, and once we were good at soccer.
Yeah. <laughs>